fans of a Horus Heresy, Legiones Astartes armoured fighting vehicles, and designs harking back to the early days of Rogue Trader, thank you very much for joining me for a model, build, and tactics review of the Sabre Strike Tank by Forge World. This model was released back in December 2019, exactly 30 years from when the first Sabre was originally conceived as a scratch build conversion in White Dwarf. So yeah, this is a modern day re-imaging of a classic Space Marine vehicle. And what I'm going to be doing in this video is I'm going to be showing you around this particular example that I've got here. So this is not just a review of the Sabre Strike Tank, but the whole Sabre Strike Tank and Armoury kit as sold on Forge World. And it's actually just an agglomeration of several kits. And what you get is you get not just the Strike Tank, but you get the Auto Cannon, Volkite and Neutron Laser. But this review equally applies as if you were to buy the hull and any one of the three primary weapon systems. So what I'm going to do in this view is I'm going to show you around the model. I'm you know, going to show off its features, design cues, and just have a look around it. I'm then going to talk about the kit quality and the build process as to how I found that and some of the magnetization and conversion I did on this vehicle. We're then going to move on to some size comparisons against a variety of other Legiones Astartes armored vehicles. And then finally, I'm going to finish up by talking about the currently available experimental rules on the Forge World website and just giving a few thoughts around how this vehicle might be used in game. So that's the plan. Firstly, let me just say what we've got here. So this is the actual Sabre Strike Tank. It's currently equipped with the Volkite Saker. We have the Anvilus Snub-Nosed Auto Cannon and the Neutron Blaster here. The way this is sold is the main weapon system and this upper deck, let's call it ammunition component or detail, are sold separately. For the main kit, you get the following. You get the saber and the upper hull mounted weapons, which we have here as a Volkite Culverin, a multi-melter, and a heavy bolt gun. There is a third weapon that comes in the kit, which is a heavy flamer. I've not got it here. It's just because I'm saving it as a spare part, so it's not cleaned up and it's on a key, but you do get it in the kit. So that's what you actually get as a, as a hull. So you don't, in the kit itself, you don't get the main gun. You have to buy that separately. And each main gun uh, kit consists of the weapon. And here we have the snub-nosed Anvilus Auto Cannon. And then it's ammunition or power pack, which is this part here. And as well as the snub-nosed Auto Cannon, we have the Neutron Blaster, which is this. And then finally, we have the Volkite Saker, which is this rather neat looking weapon uh, and a great one if you're a fan of the tomb. So that is how you actually buy this model. You can buy everything separately or there is like a one click to buy option on the Forge World website, which gives you the whole lot as you see here. If you buy it all together, you do not get a discount. That's how the kit comes. Let's now stick a weapon back on and we'll put the auto cannons in with their ammunition hopper and the heavy bolter, which we might view as being a fairly standard non-exotic weapon mix. Move the other weapons to one side and just take a look around it. So first thoughts or first observations. First thing that struck me about this tank is it looks absolutely brilliant. If you are a fan of Space Marine tanks, this thing is, it ticks all the boxes for me. It's a really, really cool design. And it's a really cool design for all sorts of reasons. Firstly, it's the sort of size and general layout of the original Sabre. So we've got some really nice nods to the historic design. And we have a fixed hull mounted forward firing weapon supported with some secondary weapons. It's about rhino sized, and we'll come back to that in the size comparison part of the video. It also has all the design cues of the, let's say the kind of like the 90s 40K vehicles, 
some older as well, some rogue trader stuff, and then very much so a design cues of a modern heresy, um, as evidenced by vehicles such as the Sicaran. You know, and, and this front plate is a strong reminiscence to that. These side armor pieces, very Sicaran in style, loads of detail. Uh, you know, this is it's not a massive model, but it's absolutely packed with detail. You get this missile launcher. Now, this, this is a conversion I did. I'm going to take it off for a moment, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little while. But yeah, that's a general, uh, the general look of the tank. This is a fast vehicle in the game, and we've got these two big, hefty exhaust units, which is suggesting that this vehicle has a very powerful engine. And I like that, or a clever design motif to indicate that this is fast, you know, a fast moving, high powered vehicle. On the right hand flank of a tank, uh, we also have a crew ladder, the same way we do on the left. And just as in the original Sabre, the main hull weapon, in this instance, we've got the Ambulus Auto Cannon is offset to the right. So we've got the driver's position on the left, main weapon system on the right. The ammo feed stroke power pack location is also offset in line with the main weapon, which is a nice feature. And I like the, the kind of a continuity of design, let's say. The, there's a commander's cupola. The lid of that lifts off, so you could model that open. You could probably fit a Space Marine tank crew miniature in there. You need a bit of conversion because the, the aperture is a bit narrower than previous kits. So you would need to do a little bit of something to open that up. The upper hull weapon sits onto this mounting bracket here and the ammo feed stroke power cabling fits into that little well there. As you probably deduced already, I've magnetized my weapon loadout. On the underside of the vehicle, uh, fully detailed, very nice. And in particular, this section here is clearly borrowed straight from the Sicaran, but there's nods to the Land Raider, Land Raider Proteus, and by extension, the original Rogue Trader Land Raider. Really nice, so yeah. And just in general, I think the proportions are absolutely spot on with this tank. It just feels right uh, to my eye. And it's very low level as well. And that fits with this idea. It's, it's like a like a fast moving tank hunter. And I'm sure that the original Sabre design was paying more than a nod to the World War II famous uh, Jagdpanzer 38T tank hunter, sometimes commonly referred to as a Hetzer. So yes, we can imagine this as a grimdark Hetzer. How about that? Let's hope the crew ergonomics are better on this vehicle than that ancient relic. And on the upper side as well, we also have some uh, detailing here, some nice little details, some nice little muck, muck in there as well, and some engine, you know, some cooling systems, engine decking, all the sort of style and themes of designs you would expect in a forge or vehicle. Yeah, really good. Okay, now let's play magnets and we'll take we'll take the heavy bolter and the auto cannon away and we'll replace it with the neutron blaster. Of course we've also got the ammunition hopper. And for this vehicle, we're going to fit it with the multi-melter. So now, from going from a general purpose anti-medium armour and infantry loadout, we have a heavy anti-tank variant. The Neutron Blaster, lots of nice design cue nods to previous Neutron Blasters, so such as featured on the Valdor Tank Hunter and the Cerberus Super Heavy Tank Destroyer. Love the look of that. And the same is also true of its power capacitance system or power supply system. And also, I suppose, in terms of the size evolution, more closely linked to this tank, the Sicaran Veneta. 
and we see the same design motifs as we do on those other vehicles, which is absolutely spot on, perfect. You know, it's a pretty standard fare multi-melter, maybe slightly different look to some that we've seen, and a slightly different look in a good way. It's, uh, it, it seems perfect to me. Yeah, really like it. Looks so cool. And I don't think, for me, it doesn't matter which weapon you put on this vehicle, it just looks right, the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Okay, now let's move on again. So moving from heavy anti-armor, now let's go to specialized anti-infantry and light armor in the form of the Volkite loadout. So we have the, the Volkite Saker. We have the power system, and then we have a Volkite Culverin, which is going to go in the upper hull position. Lovely. Again, this just looks absolutely perfect. Yeah, absolutely spot on. And Volkites have become a signature weapon design of the legions of the Heresy and other armies, but in particular the Marine Legions. And I was really pleased to see that the designers have incorporated the Volkite option onto this tank, both for in-game flexibility purposes, but also from the aesthetic standpoint as well. So in terms of design and looks, I mean, I can only give this, yeah, I can only give this 10 out of 10. It, you know, absolutely brilliant. It was a complete surprise. We've not seen it previewed before it came out. And it was lovely to uh, come out as it did. So, yeah, that was the actual de general design and look of the model. Oh, once again, just on the Volkites, in terms of the power pack, we see design motifs that if you own any of the other Volkite weapons, you'll recognize. And in particular, it put me in mind of, say, the heavier Volkite weapons, such as the Volkite Charaval of the Knight Styrix and the Volkite Carronade of the Glaive Super Heavy Special Weapons Tank. Yeah, very good. I love it. Absolutely love this vehicle design. Um, they nailed it for me. Okay, now let's move on and talk about the actual build and the kit quality. So kit quality, yep, I was happy with mine. I bought these at the time of release. Everything went together pretty well, I think. The casting quality was good. There was, I mean, I suppose a usual amount of cleanup. There was some air bubbling and a little bit of mold offsets in places. And you can see where I've had to fill it. But in the grand scheme of things, these are only minor detail repairs and you know, nothing arduous. There was certainly nothing that made me uh, scratch my head. And as is become ever more common on four-drill vehicles, we have the leave off track section uh, where the casting gate attaches to the hull side. You, you, you take the gate away, clean it up, then you put the track over, this sort of track link piece over, and you get nice detail on the track. So yeah, lovely. In terms of actually preparing and fitting the kit together, this is good. On both of my examples, I had to remove a warp in the side track units. And I found that they were both slightly bowed out like that. I'm exaggerating this here with my hands, but they were bowed out. And that was noticeable because when you put it together, either you had a gap in the front hole here or the rear hole here. My remedy to that was to immerse each part in freshly boiled hot water, allow it to soften slightly, and then uh, get them out, put it together, and basically bend it into shape. I think that's how I did this. And the end result was very good. And I got a very snug fit all round. And once that bend had been removed, it did go together very easily. There are good connecting lugs, so it's easy to figure out which part goes where. So this is one long hull piece here that then attaches onto this hull piece here. You've got very clear attachment geometries around the hull section, around the tracks here. And then there's a nice chunky notch alignment bit at the rear where these armored louvres lock in. And all in all, I thought the whole hull went together really nicely. 
no issues at all. Some careful prep work around these areas, and that is to ensure that I got a nice aligned finish. I did a little bit of sanding afterwards on those, as you can probably see. Some slight gaps out, I think that will fill with paint. I may put some filler in, but nothing big. I also actually just remembered I did bend, heat up and bend this section and this section of the upper hull to get this alignment really sharp. In terms of clean up on the weapons, another part, I mean, generally good though. I mean, as you can see, there's a mold slip there that I filled. And there are a couple of bits like on these which needed a little bit of filling work. Well, as I say, nothing, um, nothing too bad. And of course, you know, when I build my models, I always aim to build them so there's no artifacts of a casting process. Uh, I try to get them looking in the same way that the Forge World and pre-production copies that they use on their websites look, and that's my aim. So yeah, in terms of casting quality, good. There was a bit of extra work to do on the underside of this Volkite Saker. It was a little bit slip, this, and it took quite a lot of careful knife work and filling to restore that. However, the upper side was perfectly aligned. So I suppose given that that's somewhat out of view, that wasn't too bad. Yeah, not too bad at all. Yeah, overall nicely cast and a, a real pleasure to build. I really enjoyed building this one. Well, I actually have two. I will come back to that, but I enjoyed building both of them. They were really fun. So we'll stick the Volkite back on. I'm not going to talk a lot about the conversion I did on the missile pack, but I will draw some attention to it. As you can see, I've taken the four Sabre missiles and turned them into a single mount. It's not stuck on yet, and this is just for demonstration purposes. I did a separate video where I showed how I was converting those, so I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but this was just, I, I much preferred this idea of a layout to the way it's designed. And they're supposed to fit one into each of these lugs, so two per side of a tank. Now, I didn't like them in terms of the strength of how they were attaching and the location of a weapon. I suppose the look as well. And I much prefer this approach where we have this, um, like this weapon cluster as a top mounted system. And that I also feel is much more consistent with Hunter Killer Missile weapon designs from Games Workshop vehicles in the past. So yeah, I did that. In terms of magnetization, I mean, this kit, if you buy the armor, it's an absolute treasure trove of magnetization options. For the main guns, I used four by three millimeter N52 grade. I think they're N52, you could use N52 or N35, I think it'd be strong enough. Grade neodymium magnets for the main weapon, one in each. And for the upper hull, I think these are two by one millimeter neodymium magnets. And there are, now let me remember, there's a, I think there was two in there and two in there. That gives a decent hold. Not particularly strong, but it's strong enough and it's not going to fall off. For the weapon mount, I think I used the same. Do I use the same size magnets? No, I used bigger ones. So here I used three by one millimeter neodymium magnets. And I just forget, I might have put two in here and two in here, I think, yeah. And that isn't a lot of hold, but again, it's just enough to hold it in place and stop it dropping out. Of course, if you bought one of these and only wanted a single weapon system, you just stick it together. Robert's your father's brother and you're off. Yeah, very good. Fun to build and as a magnetization project, lots of fun to be had there as well. Really recommend it. I will just talk about kit cost on this one. I don't normally talk about forge or kit cost because I think it's one of those things. For the size of resin models they are and the type of business, the size of business and type of business that Forge World is part of, I think they're reasonably priced if you look at the competition and, and make an allowance for the huge overhead costs that Games Workshop has. I think they're fine. However, on this one, it is a bit more of an expensive buy if you go for the armory. If you just go for a single vehicle with one weapon option, I think that's about, about 65 quid or something. I just forget now, about 65 pounds, which is comparable to similar size custodes vehicles, etc. 
you know, full resin custodies vehicles, such as a Palace Grab Attack. However, if you order the full set of weapons or an extra one, then the costs do climb up and the full armory, as I've got here, is actually the same cost, actually a little bit more cost than a Sikaran tank. And as you'll see in a moment, the Sikaran is a much bigger vehicle. So do be mindful of that if you're tempted to buy the armory. You are paying extra money, in effect, for getting all these weapon options packaged as separate kits and the inefficiency and cost that that introduces to the design. So just, a, just something to consider there. As I say, don't normally talk about cost, but I think it is a fair observation on this instance. One other thing in terms of modeling, before I move on, as is often the case, nice opportunity for a bit of barrel boring. And in particular, the Anvilus Auto Cannon are a lot of fun. It's a very intricate, complicated design. With the Auto Cannon muzzle brakes, they've got this kind of crenulated look now. I need to check what that is. I don't think that's part of, that's to do with muzzle braking. I wonder if it's to do with flash suppression. I need to look that up. Maybe if one of you guys or girls knows what this crenulation is, you can explain. I have seen it on modern um, battle rifles, I think. I'm not quite sure what the purpose is and whether or not it would be relevant to such a large caliber weapon. But yeah, answer in the comments, please. But that was really fun to drill these little side holes out and then bore out the main barrels. Yeah, looks really good, great fun. Yeah, that is the build process. And final thing on the build process, it comes with very clear, straightforward and accurate instructions in the modern style CAD print. So no issues to worry about there at all. Right, let's now do some size comparisons. So shall we? Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's continue changing with this. I think we're gonna go Newton laser for a bit. So we're gonna flip it back into its dedicated anti-armor configuration. Of course, you can pair any hull weapon with any uh, upper hull weapon. But, you know, you don't have to put the multi-melter with the neutron laser. So firstly, let's start off with a, an Astartes Legionnaire. And here we have a brother of the Iron Hands with a Phobos pattern bolter and wearing Mark II Crusade armor, which we all want to see return. So size-wise, what do we think? It is, it's not a big vehicle at all. You probably... Imagine, I imagine this has been one marine vehicle. I don't see it having space for a second crew. Yeah, they're not massive at all, not massive at all. Quite small, actually. And thinking with, sticking with things on legs, let's compare it to a, a Dreadnought. So here we have a Deradio Dreadnought. This is not part of the Iron Hands. This is going to go all super truthful with the word bearers. Radio armed with Volkite. Falconets and the Boreas air defense missiles. And now the Doradio is a big dreadnought. It's you know it's one of the supersized dreadnoughts, but it do, even so it does make the saber look quite small. And I think even if you were to put a standard Castroferum or Contemptor dreadnought alongside the saber. It's still, it's not a big vehicle at all, is it? It's not large. And sticking with that, let's move on to probably what is the best size comparator in terms of the vehicle's lineage, which is a Demos pattern Rhino. So here we have a, a lovely Rhino, armed with a, a bit of extra gunnery in the form of the heavy bolter in the cupola. And if we put that alongside the Sabre, we see that actually the saber is slightly smaller. It's probably its hull is probably just a little bit lower than the rhino, and in terms of width, it's a bit narrower. Obviously, you can't see this due to camera perspective, but I would say the rhino is around ten percent wider. Lengthwise, if I put them track to track, well, here the two are the same length. And in that comparison, I'm excluding the dozer blade. So yeah, they are the same length, but if you were to work out the volume, then the saber is smaller. Okay, let's take away the dreadnought and the marine and move up the vehicle scale. So we'll move our 
Rhino to one side and bring forth the Sakaran. So now we are into a marine vehicle which came about as part of the Heresy range. And this is kind of like where we come back to what I said about cost. Yeah, if you buy this with all these weapons, this costs a little bit more than that. So size-wise, well, the Sikaran, it is much bigger. It is a good 20% taller. Width-wise, probably about 25% wider. And length-wise, again, is probably around 25% longer than the Sabre. The Sikaran is a much bigger vehicle. It encapsulates a lot more volume. Now, this is interesting because from the point of view of a having something big, the Sikaran has more to it. But when we're thinking gaming, the Sabre is going to be able to get into places that these things just can't get. And also the Sabre can hide in places where the Sikaran can't. So something to think about. Moving forth, right, let's now move up another classic vehicle before something new. So, what do we have here? Well, here we have a Land Raider Mark IIb, Hauser era Land Raider. Now the Sabre is looking pretty titchy. Clearly the Land Raider is much taller, about a quarter taller. Width-wise, even if we ignore the sponsons, the Land Raider is about a third wider. If we include the sponsons, then to my eye, and please do excuse a camera distortion, the Land Raider is about 80% wider. And then on the length front, it's probably a bit less extreme, but the Land Raider is still a third longer. So yeah, a bigger vehicle all round. And I suppose you would expect that given what a Land Raider is. Let's do one more. And this is a, another new vehicle actually, and one I haven't reviewed yet, so you're getting a cheeky peek. And this is the Legion Arquitor Bombard. This particular one is armed with the Spicular Rocket Battery and auto cannons in its sponsor. So this is brand new and of a similar design vintage to the Sabre. So everybody's gonna have to shuffle back. So sorry, um, sorry you guys. Now, what do we think? Right, let's do, well, let's put you on you, this side. So firstly, width. Well, the Arquitor is a chunky monkey and it's kind of Land Rover sized. So, yeah, it's about a quarter wider. Height-wise, it's at least a quarter higher. Probably up to here, it's maybe a third higher. So I think that's probably right, yeah. See, Arquitor is the same height as a Land Raider. And lengthwise, well, it's even more dramatic, I think, than the Land Raider. The Arquitor is a good third longer. So the Arquitor is quite a big vehicle, isn't it? Which I think is intentional, but there you go. I hope that gives you a feel for the relative size of the Sabre compared to its Legion contemporaries. And this is something that got caught a lot of us out and was actually a bit of a surprise. The, the photographs on the Warhammer community website and the Forger website made it look bigger than it was. <laughs> I figured it because you could tell from a perspective of the models that have been put in the forum background. And I like that they've done it this size. Yeah, I really appreciate that slightly smaller vehicle. And it also fits with its design lineage in terms of the original Rhino. So yeah. And I think in terms of a gaming piece, it fits nicely as well because you can get this thing into little nooks and crannies you can't normally squeeze a vehicle in. Right, talking of gaming, let's now move on and review the rules. So we shall take away the Legion Heavy Armour as to not have visual distractions. We shall bring back the other weapons. Okay then, so rules and tactics for the Legion Sabre Strike Tank. In terms of my source of rules, I'm using the experimental rules that have been posted on the Forge World website. I expect these to become official when Book Nine Crusade is published later this year, this year being 2020. Let's run over this. So Legion Sabre Strike Tank. It costs 65 points for a single Sabre. 
It has the following statistics. Ballistic skill 4, front armor 12, side armor 11, rear armor 10, and it has three hull points. In terms of unit, you can take between one and two Sabre Strike tanks, and that fits in the fast attack slot of the Legionis Astartes Crusade list. It is a vehicle with the special rules of tank and fast. Its war gear is a hull-mounted Anvilus snub auto cannon, a hull-mounted heavy vaulter, a smoke launcher, a searchlight, and an auxiliary drive. And it has a special rule of missile lock. You get a number of weapon options in the Sabre. You can replace the snub-nosed auto cannon for a neutron blaster at 20 points, a Volkite Saker at plus 15. You can then exchange the heavy bolter for a heavy flame for free, a multi melter for 25 points, or a Volkite Culverin for plus 15. You then have additional pintle weapon mount options of a combi weapon for 5 points, a Havoc launch for 15, or a twin linked bolter for 5. And then you have a number of other upgrades available. Armoured Ceramite, 20 points, extra armour at 10, and up to four Sabre Missiles, and these are the Sabre Missiles at five points each. In terms of a general layout, it's a light, fast tank. Fast tank means you can move up to advanced speed and fire all of your weapons at full ballistic skill. You can move at cruise speed and fire two of your weapons at full ballistic skill. This thing's about maneuver and hitting hard with this weapon and this weapon in the main, I think. Let's now run over the weapon profiles. Obviously the Coppola weapons and the Pintle weapons, we all know what those are, so I'm not gonna to touch on those. The other weapons are fairly familiar, but with different range profiles. So the Anvilus Snub Auto Cannon is range 24, strength eight, AP4, heavy two, twin linked and sunder. So this is like a half ranged version of the Anvilus Auto Cannon from the Deradio Dreadnought. And it does exactly the same thing. The Newton Blaster, is range 24, strength 9, AP2, heavy 1, concussive and shock pulse. So this is in effect a toned down version of the Neutron laser from the Sikaran Venator. The Volkite Saker is range 24, strength 6, AP5, and it has the rules of heavy 6 and deflagrate. In effect, we've got a weapon with the hitting power of a Volkite Culverin at a slightly unusual range band of 24 for a Volkite, but 50% more shots, so heavy six as opposed to heavy four. And finally, the Sabre missiles. Now, the Sabre missiles are range 36, strength four, AP four, heavy one, one use, and rending. So what do I think about this in terms of how it can be tactically used? Well, firstly, it's cheap at 65 points for the basic configuration with the auto cannon. That's not bad. It also fits within the fast attack slot and it is the only tracked vehicle to do so in the Legion list. So if you are wanting to go all out tanks, so for example, if you're playing Armored Spearhead, this is a great way of getting even more tanks into your force. If you are a player of a fast moving hard hitting Legion, so let's say the White Scars, fast moving tanks in the fast slot, given you've already got a lot of fast moving troops, that's a useful addition as well. I think Putting a tank in the fast attack slot makes a lot of sense. In terms of a general layout, well, it's not particularly heavily armoured, from armour of 12, side 11, so it's, you do not get this into slugging fights with other units. Clearly, you are going to get shot up quite quickly. However, three hull points is, you know, that's decent, and it's really designed for getting around the side of things and plugging them with whatever weapon you've got. So in the case of the auto cannon neutron blaster, flanking shots on heavy armored targets, perfect. In the case of Saker, it's a fast moving way of putting anti-infantry firepower in the right place. All the Capola weapons are complementary to the main guns. I think they're all decent. They're costed about what they'll normally be. I think 25 points on a multi-melter is I think that, is that normal 25 was it 20 i just forget now but that's quite a lot of points and makes the vehicle much more expensive but with a fast type you can see why because that then become you give your weapon a 36 inch threat range because you can move 12 and then shoot 24. so the auto cannon general purpose anti-tank gun shoot up robots shoot up marines you know good at knocking off hull points, probably maybe okay at pinch at aircraft. The Volkite Saker, good against light armor, infantry, some robots, decent, a, a good gun. I mean, with these two, with this one, with the Culverin and the Saker, you've got 10 shots at 24. With the Newton Blaster, 
you've got a very cheap entry into the shock pulse rule. So to do that, you would be looking at 85 points with the base armament. If you were to put that on, you're talking about 110. Well, at 110, you're starting to get a little bit, you're starting to move a little bit towards the cost of a Vindicator laser destroyer. But still, shock pulse at such a low cost is very tempting. And at strength nine, you can seriously threaten some of the super heavy units in the game with this thing. And of course, if you get a shock pulse penetrating hit, those vehicles are only snap firing thereafter. And that's a big boon. So yeah, I can imagine this being a popular choice. So I think weapon-wise, I, th I think it, all the weapons do the job. They all seem to be pointed competitively. It fits in a good slot for the Legion list. It's not doing something that... It's doing similar things to Legion tanks we've had already, but it's doing them in a lighter, faster way. And, and that's of use, and the points reflect that. Now, the Sabre missiles perhaps are a little different, and we need to scrutinise those with a little bit more focus. Now, for a full cluster of four, you look at an extra 20 points. So that costs the same as upgraded to the Neutron Blaster. Now, range 36 is decent, coupled with its fast speed, you're looking at a threat radius of 48, that's a lot. Strength 6 is all right, AP4 is meh for a missile weapon, although if you're looking at in terms of the weapon profile overall, overall, well, it, it, AP4 would, you know, in terms of sort of targets you'd shoot at, synergize well with the auto cannon and perhaps the Volkite. However, it does have the rending rule. So what become, you know, what starts as strength six could become strength nine AP2. You know, potentially quite a powerful missile is a Sabre missile, but one in six chance you can't depend on it. Now, another thing you've got to weigh up with the Sabre missile is the fact that you can buy four, but as I read the rules, you can only shoot one per turn, I think. Please correct me if you're wrong, if you think you can fire all four, or four at one go, but I do think you can only shoot one. I don't know, maybe I've got that wrong. Hmm. I wonder if you, if you, ah, maybe if you go at advancing speed, you can fire all of your weapons at full ballistic skill, in which case, does that mean you can move up to six and then shoot all four missiles at one go at full ballistic skill along with your main gun and your upper hull gun and if you're packing it your pintle weapon that's an interesting thought i'll be interested to hear what you all think but in terms of the saber missiles are they worth it hmm i'm a bit on the fence to that as to whether or not it's worth spending the points on those and i guess that's where this vehicle there's a bit of a trap there if you take it in this configuration, so you've got 110 points, then three missiles, 130. And then if you put a pintle weapon on it, you can actually get it up to 145 points. Now, 145 points is getting rather close to a Sikaran. So, yeah, is it worth it? Hmm. I don't know. I guess, obviously, durability-wise, no. And range-wise, no. But you'd have a very heavily armed small tank at that point so yeah i don't know i think it's worth considering i think probably the best use of this is in a more simple configuration so using the volkite mix or the auto cannons but even then i still think that this expensive layout and particularly those two would work really well i think i'm, a, I'm still a bit on the fence about that and particularly would you add a combi weapon on on top of all these other guns. Well, when you think combi weapon will have it launcher, that's quite long range, so that could be handy. A twin link bolter, given that a lot of your weapons are at 24 anyway, then you'll get a chance to use it potentially. Particularly if you're arming with the Volkite, where you're gonna be shooting infantry a lot of time, I imagine, then a combi bolter could be handy. I suppose what's more tempting there is a combi weapon, because with the change in the rules on grenade launcher, so combi grenade launchers and combi Volkite chargers means they don't have one shot rules yeah i think if you were to stick one of those on there then you've got even a strength five or a strength six weapon and that yeah for five extra points that's worth doing yeah i'm now thinking i might do that myself yeah. interesting opportunities there with the weapon options on this tank we'll be interested to hear what you think on the whole weapons and tactical use option around this. Do you think you can spend way too many points on it or is the fast moving little gunship tank a worthy addition to the force? 
I think one really important thing to remember about this tank is the fact that you can take them in pairs as a squadron. And I bought two for this very reason. And I think keep, kept fairly simple, you can get an awful lot of firepower for your points and utilize part of your list that normally doesn't allow you to get such a large amount of raw firepower in. I mean, clearly you can put things like the javelin attack speeders in to the fast attack slot, but they don't have the durability and they just can't match these things for raw firepower, I don't think. And they cost more as well. They cost more, but they're, they're more expensive units. Another little thought there. Anyway, I think that is a lot of time spent talking about the Sabre Strike Tank. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Overall, though, I think from a modeling perspective, these are absolutely spot on. 10 out of 10. Unreserved recommendation on them as models. They look lovely. Yeah, just absolutely perfect. We talked a little bit. We thought a bit about the price. We're buying all the weapon options. And then on the games front, I think, yeah, they're a good addition to the Legion list and give players something new and different that they, something really new and different that they didn't previously have. So those are all my thoughts on the Legion Saber Strike Tank for the Legion as a starters list in the Horus Harris game. As always, I'd like to hear what you think in the comment section. So please do share your observations and thoughts as well. If you're enjoying the content I'm making at the moment, because I'm currently not able to work because of the COVID outbreak and pandemic situation, if you do enjoy my content, please do consider supporting me, even temporarily, and if you can afford it, on Patreon. And I also have a PayPal account as well, if you'd like to contribute. Links are in the description. And if you can do that, it really would help me. But other than that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you next time, and goodbye.